welcome to Gayfield Creative Spaces, uh, our bunker basement area, and the first of our 2015 series of Gayfield Talks. We'll have five talks in the series, every Tuesday and week Thursdays for the next three weeks. Uh, so the next one's on Thursday evening. I'm delighted to be in introducing our speakers this evening. Um, first talk will be Chris Fleeton, but after that will be Anna Feinberg. Anna has energy, uh, erudition, and has inspired me uh, on a daily basis. And my kind of geeky tendency to, to build out my map has been really energized, and I thank Anna for that. Um, and I have a particular thanks to uh, Chris Fleet of the National Libraries of Scotland, uh, whose dedication and meticulous support for the project has allowed it to happen with the depth and rigor that it has. Um, I've got a small gift for Chris to say thank you. Um, as some of you know, we're uh, a gay field all about uh, creativity. And this, <laughs> I like the stereotype of a, an academic wearing a bow tie. This is a bow tie made, recycled from, uh, from an existing time, made in one of our colleagues in South Africa, uh, South Africa would be amazing with the later in the year. Chris, thank you very much. You're not a geeky academic, you're anything but, but I hope you enjoy it. Oh, that's really thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, we're a select group this evening. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'd like to say three other thank yous. Uh, first to uh, Evan Ratrick, who is here. And Evan's going to say a one or two little words um, to us in a minute. And he has created a beautiful new map of Edinburgh. He's a print maker working in Dundee. And I'm delighted to say there'll be an exclusive print run uh, for Gayfield in uh, this summer, 11 uh, editions in our key card. And um, it's all being sold around Edinburgh in the artist key cards. Um, so I'll let uh, him speak to that in a minute. To John Biggie of Frameworks, you're a fantastic resource in Edinburgh. They've worked at many, we've worked with John and his team at Frameworks for many years. And they've provided us with this wonderful 17th century map of Edinburgh, which I think is a lovely compliment to the 19th century maps that which you have upstairs and we had a chance to view, which really gives some uh, presence to the program that we've developed. Um, mostly tonight, though, I'd like to fight Lan Turnbull, our highly valued neighbours round the corner, Scotland's premier auction house. Um, I'd attend every single at Lion and Turnbull if it wasn't my complete lack of paddle control. There's so much wonderful happening in there. Um, and they've been a, a mentor to me as a new business in the area. I saw Lion and Turnbull established some years ago, and uh, we're very lucky to have them here. And they've been very supportive of me personally as a new business in the area. <coughs> I'd like to specifically mention two upcoming sales this Thursday, uh, a fantastic sale which I definitely can't go to, it's called of art, uh, contemporary art and post war art. Um, I will go, of course. Um, and a wonderful sale of maps, uh, rare books and manuscripts on the 2nd of September. So it's a treat for the sale. I'll, I've been in Edinburgh for 30 years and I've seen the museum sector contract and expand and a lot of the expertise that was in the museum sector is back there again, but a wonderful repository of expertise that sits in our auction houses and land and turmoil are really amongst the best and I'm very proud that we're, we're neighbours. So um, a quick word from our artist before we hand over to Chris Fleet and Anna uh, Fajic. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, just a couple of words, I'm not going to keep you for too long. Uh, this is completely unexpected for me. Um, as John says, I'm a printmaker from Dundee. I did a, a typographic map of Dundee a couple of years ago and then very quickly decided I wanted to then do one of Edinburgh as well. So the last couple of days I've been maps under my arm, trawling around the streets of Edinburgh to various different galleries to see if there was any interest in them. Probably about Two hours ago, I was wandering aimlessly around the streets of Leith. I don't really know anyone that well at all, so I was a bit lost. Um, and I found my way down this mysterious little road, and uh, I thought, this is a gallery. Let's go in and see if they can uh, give me any directions to other galleries. Um, and uh, John says, OK, I'll take you around to the place you're looking for. And then about halfway around the road, we realised that there was a bit of synchronicity going on here. I had a map, and there was a, a talk going on tonight with the map. Mm -hmm. so we thought, 
actually, let's go back to the gallery and see if we can do stuff here. This, this might actually work together. Um, and then when I got the map out and let John have a look at it, I managed to spot a gay field on the map and started jumping around the room. That was when I came <laughs> Literally from. jumping. Yeah, yeah. literally, <laughs> actually jumping around this very room. I thought, right, this is definitely something I can work with here. So it's been very quick, it's been very fast, and uh, yeah, so here we are. Now I'm standing on stage, looking about my map, but it certainly wasn't expecting this a couple of hours ago. So it's great, I'm um, really happy to be here, I'm looking forward to it. I guess if there is any moral to this, um, it's probably that as handy as smartphones are with their built-in phone apps, if you have one of these, then sometimes you just get lost in happy relaxing and happening. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce the first speaker, Chris Slate of National Library Scotland. Great, well, many thanks for that uh, kind introduction, uh, John, and this invitation to speak this evening. And thank you uh, to you all for coming here. This uh, project in inspired me from the beginning, and I was very grateful to John for the idea of collaborating with Gayfield on the, a series of, uh, of walks, historic maps, and uh, web applications, and also to Anna as well. And it's been very nice over the last few weeks to put together uh, things for this, this exhibition. This talk this evening also brings together uh, a couple of other subjects quite nicely. The, the National Library of Scotland, where I work, is also a partner in the MESH project, Mapping Edinburgh's Social History, which Anna is very much involved with too, which is run by the University of Edinburgh, uh, constructing an electronic and hard copy atlas of Edinburgh. And connected to that too, NLS is also uh, proud to hold the Bartholomew Archive, which we'll be talking more about this evening, one of the largest commercial cartographic archives in the world. And uh, this forms a connecting theme for the MESH project, as well as uh, what we'll talk about uh, this evening. So I'm going to talk in, uh, initially for the first half hour, uh, and no more, I hope, about the Bartholomew family and firm, looking at who they were, uh, where they worked in Edinburgh, and then looking at just a few specific Bartholomew maps of Edinburgh and the stories that they reveal. And Anna will then take over for the second half and give things a more intelligent underpinning, looking at some of the doctoral research themes, uh, including Bartholomew's publishing and commercial context in Edinburgh. And if there's time, uh, at the end, we may also briefly show you the Gayfield uh, Maps uh, website we put together and uh, the NLS website as well. So as you might expect me to say, uh, surrounded here by maps, especially maps are wonderful things, illuminating as artifacts, vital as historical resources and indispensable for us today in all sorts of everyday contexts, very much taken for granted. And we also have, I feel, the privilege of being here this evening, and for, I suspect, many of us too, of living and working in, in one of the world's great cities. And our talk brings these two themes uh, together and hopefully shows how maps can illustrate something of the history of Edinburgh in, in quite a captivating form. Maps can be enjoyed at many levels, and at a, a very immediate aesthetic level, I think we can be impressed just by the sheer artistry and aesthetics of a map. But if we delve beneath that, if we go beyond that, each can also illustrate an, the historical context and culture of their time period. And what I'll, I'll do with our, the few Bartholomew examples is deconstruct the maps a little, looking at who made the maps, why they made them, who they made them for, and by asking these questions, we can hopefully understand them and uh, enjoy them even more. We're lucky too, Edinburgh's got a very distinguished cartographic heritage, uh, as well as a better known printing and publishing heritage. A number of leading map makers lived in Edinburgh. It was also the center of uh, large cartographic initiatives in the mid 18th century, the center of the Roy Military Survey of Scotland. In the 1820s, John Thompson's monumental Atlas of Scotland. And from the later 18th century onwards, the city also grew 
to become a major centre of expertise in engraving, as this expanded to include printing in the 19th century. Publishers like W. and A.K. Johnston and Bartholomew became justly famous all over the world. So let's look in a, a bit more detail at who the Bartholomews were. Why were they important? And I feel, in many ways, the Bartholomews have something of their own life cycle. They're kind of fledgling early beginnings in the 19th century, very much as engravers and printers for other people. Very much their adulthood in the late 19th century as a major cartographic publishing company. And perhaps sadly, their eventual decline and takeover in the late 20th century. And perhaps we can look at key common strands behind that success. I tend to feel their expertise originally in engraving and printing made them outstanding and highly sought after in the early years. When they combine that with the technique of color lithography, the ability to print maps in multiple shades of color and accurately register those colors together, that allowed them a kind of global supremacy in a, a household style that's still with us today. But I think underpinning all of the, the technical expertise with Bartholomew were the aspirations, particularly in the, the heads of the Bartholomew firm and the family, which were intellectual, geographic, and also commercial. So just uh, looking at a, a few of the Bartholomews in sequence, things really kick off with George Bartholomew, the first engraver in the family, apprentice to Daniel Lizars in Edinburgh from the late 18th century, and he continued to work for Lizars as a general engraver, including map engraving. The early Bartholomews were very much engravers, but they worked for some of the finest engravers in Edinburgh, the firm of Lizars, Daniel and his son William Home Lizars, who went on to become a talented painter as well as engraver and etcher. And it's worth reminding us of too, the standard way of printing maps from the 16th century onwards had been through copper plate engraving. And all the 19th century Bartholomews spent years perfecting this, this art. It was often a seven-year apprenticeship to become an engraver. John Bartholomew, a senior, as he was often later called, followed his father as an engraver, completing his apprenticeship with William Home Lizars. But he chose to work as an independent engraver, working from home. His first commercial premises were established at 4 North Bridge, just to the, the east of, uh, of where North Bridge reaches the, uh, the Royal Mile. This was shared with the publishers Adam and Charles Black, who were publishers of the Encyclopedia Britannica and the Edinburgh Review. His son, John Jr., trained with his father, and then significantly with the German geographer August Petermann in London for a couple of years in the early 1850s. In the second half of the 19th century, German cartography was widely admired for its technical and intellectual sophistication. And uh, John Jr.'s son and grandson both spent important apprentice years in Germany. Following this experience, he expanded the firm and introduced three new steam presses for printing in color. He also traveled to North America to try and increase business. And it was arguably under his son, uh, John George Bartholomew, that the firm really accelerated into a new era. John George struggled against many odds in life, a lifelong tubercular condition, but he continually drove himself and the firm to rise above these odds, expanding production, innovating, and introducing new techniques. Uh, through him, most of all, uh, we can say Bartholomew became a household name around the world. John George studied at Edinburgh University, and in 1884, when he was only 24 years old, he founded the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, which still survives very much today. He succeeded his father in 1888, when he was only 28 years old. And it's difficult to distill his many achievements down. He introduced new business methods and organization. The bulk of our, our archive in NLS 
survives from John George's time. And he moved to share printing works with Thomas Nelson, a very large uh, publisher, renaming uh, the firm as the Edinburgh Geographical Institute, which very much emulated the Perters Geographical Institute in Leipzig that John Jorg so admired. Both Pertus and Bartholomew were both commercial cartographers. Their business depended really on quite everyday lucrative contracts, but both were driven by much broader aspirations. For John George, cartography was a very high art, a way of visualizing the world in new ways, a ways of appreciating the world better, and so making the world a better place through maps. Cartographers, of course, can create new geographic uh, realities quite as much as they represent it. And reasonably enough, Bartholomew struggled to really enjoy uh, their new premises with, uh, with Nelson, which was on, on the street gibbet alone. Um, no matter, through their predominant role in producing map after map, street maps of Edinburgh, within a few years, they'd managed to indelibly put Park Road there, their new road, uh, there on the map, and this is still the, the name that it has today. Purpose-built premises followed in 1911 at Duncan Street, where the firm remained until 1995. And the firm also expanded its publishing output uh, rather than just printing maps for others to publish. Uh, John George saw through major atlas projects, including a, a survey atlas of, uh, of Scotland and important thematic atlases, including an atlas of meteorology and zoo, zoo geography. Uh, he also had a very good sense of color in terms of color aesthetics and developed his father's innovative layer coloring. And so Bartholomew became, by this time, almost completely involved in map production. It hadn't been until this time, but it was very much from John George's time onwards. So under uh, John George's son, uh, who was also John, but uh, often called Ian uh, Bartholomew, or Captain Ian, after his uh, war years. And Ian also studied in, uh, in Leipzig, in Paris, uh, and after his distinguished war service, he very much consolidated the gains uh, that Bartholomew had, continuing the long tradition of association with the Times and their survey atlases, seeing through the mid-century edition of the Times Atlas of the World. Captain Ian also campaigned and was successful in setting up the first map room or map library in NLS. It might not seem a, an important external achievement, but it's usually important for us in NLS. We're very grateful to him, if you like, as our founding father, a trustee of NLS, but wanting to very much position maps uh, centrally in the institution. And under Ian's sons, uh, John, Peter, and Robert, this was really the last of the six generations of the family in the business. And whilst they managed to maintain uh, the firm as a leading map publisher. In the end, they succumbed to broader economic imperatives. The firm was bought, first of all, by Reader's Digest in, the 19, in 1980, and then by News International uh, in 1985. And they uh, relinquished their interests in the firm in 1980. And it's worth saying, too, uh, this is really very much reflecting much broader economic uh, and technological changes that affected publishing as much as cartography. As a family firm, Bartholomew really survived much longer than many other Edinburgh cartographers and publishers. But it was a, a steady globalization of cartography, uh, publishing, and printing, a relentless drive to outsource work, particularly to low-wage countries, and then added to that digital technologies in the last 30 years have completely transformed the practical craft of map making that was with us until relatively recent times. Uh, now maps are made in, in completely different ways and the availability of free online maps and satellite imagery by large global companies like Google 
and Microsoft continue to make life very difficult for the very few remaining smaller cartographic firms in Britain. So a brief summary history of Bartholomew to uh, set the scene. And what I'd like to do now is just share with you uh, a few of, if you like, my favorite maps, but they're all maps by Bartholomew. And I selected them also for some of the links that they have uh, between them. Maps, of course, represent reality at one level. We all expect a map to relate to the world out there. But another important, very important point is how they, they misrepresent reality, how they don't show what is out there as well, or they choose to show particular things rather than others. And I feel this is what makes them so interesting to us today. Uh, the four maps that I've chosen, all dating from the late 19th to the uh, early 20th century, look in turn at, at subjects like health, at lighting, uh, the sighting of the Usher Hall, and also drink uh, at alcohol. And uh, all of them, I think, are quite nice illustrations of Bartholomew's thematic mapping using a uh, relatively plain black and white street background, and most importantly, a colored overlay to hammer home some particular point, to communicate information on a particular theme or subject. And I feel all maps, too, are political in the sense that they select some things over others. They choose to represent some people or some people's interests better than others. But they're also political in a much more subtle and important way. And this is the way in which they encourage their readers, if you like us, all of us as map readers, to think and act in a different way. They make us visualize and think about the world around us in a new way. And that is a, an immensely powerful thing. It guides the way that we look at the world around us. So this map um, plots the location of the first 1,000 cases of tuberculosis that were recorded by the new Victoria Dispensary from 1887 to 1890. And it's interesting not just for how widespread uh, the cases are. I hope you can just see on my image uh, a scattering of red dots across the map, but also for this uneven distribution. The worst affected areas were the Old Town and the South Side, and a, a, a kind of extension uh, moving westwards and, uh, and, and eastwards uh, on the South Side too. And the map formed part of a detailed paper presented uh, by a man called Philip to the medico Chirurgical Society, uh, as it was called, in Edinburgh in March 1892, synthesizing vital statistics from the cases that he had examined. And it was also subsequently published in the Edinburgh Medical Journal. And there's a number of reasons I like this map. First of all, as a reminder of actually how uh, widespread and frightening tuberculosis was only a century ago, responsible for about 10% of all deaths in Edinburgh in 1890. And although the bacillus that caused tuberculosis had been identified and described in the decade before, the first widespread use of an effective vaccine only occurred after the Second World War. In the 1890s, tuberculosis was poorly understood and popularly blamed on everything from prostitution to vampires, but even the well-educated tended to see it as a fellow traveler of vice and sin. And the map commemorates the work of Philip, uh, Dr. Robert Philip, who founded the Victoria Dispensary for Consumption and Diseases of the Chest, which was initially located on a set of flats in Bank Street, just there running down from the Royal Mile, um, and it subsequently moved to Lauriston Place. This just uh, shows a a detail um, of the old town from the same map. And it also illustrates Philip's empirical and conscientious methods to try and better understand the disease, to improve public health by the right forms of treatment. Patients presenting themselves were placed in one of three categories. There were advanced or early onset and also cured patients who required isolation. 
Advanced cases were sent to the, the city fever hospital that was at this time uh, in high school yards, but subsequently from 1897 uh, was the, the new Craig Lockhart fever hospital. The early onset cases were sent to a sanatorium that was usually the Victoria Hospital for consumption in Craig Leith. And there was also an isolation farm set up, the Poulton Farm Colony that opened near Laswade in 1910. So the map also commemorates this very important work by uh, Philip. It was particularly valuable for poorer inhabitants of the city. And as a core component of the Edinburgh anti-tuberculosis scheme, it went on to have quite an influence in the development of similar models in other towns. My next map, I have uh, four uh, examples, uh, shows the progress of electric lighting up to its introduction, uh, sorry, from its introduction in 1895 up to 1898. And I hope again you can see something of the, the distribution of uh, red lines. We'll zoom in on it uh, in a moment. Bartholomew printed 200 copies of this map for the town council, very much as an in-house tool to help plan further electrification from that date onwards. And although we might imagine, I certainly imagined, that there would have been great enthusiasm for the wonders of instant electric lighting in the late 19th century, the press at the time is full of criticisms, uh, full of complaints, uh, illustrating the contrary. At times, it seemed virtually the whole of Edinburgh, the whole of the streets and pavements were being dug up simultaneously. When I read that, I thought, hmm, we've, seen, we've been there. We've been there recently. Um, but some were also unhappy about the large quantities of black smoke that belch forth from the new power station that you can see, hopefully, with a, a red triangle that was just off uh, Morrison uh, Street near the Haymarket. And they expressed nostalgia for the, the clear skies and fine sunsets we used to enjoy. But more serious and alarming were frequent explosions caused by escaping gas which fused under the pavement with the, the electrics. And on occasion, residents were shocked to see paving stones literally blown out of the ground three to four feet high. There were hissing noises and then fading of, uh, of lights nearby. Worse still, the location of the lamps caused major criticism, often running straight down thoroughfares and the middle of, uh, of uh, walkways, such as Middle Meadow Walk that just creeps onto the bottom of uh, the graphic down here. And as one writer to the Scotsman uh, observed, these lamps were a great inconvenience as, as well as danger to the blind. And he said, being proof of a great want of light among civic officials of that department. Oh, he must have enjoyed, must have enjoyed making that up. Uh, but perhaps most fundamentally also, uh, as illustrated with these two uh, graphics here zooming in, it was a very uneven distribution of lights. Some, some parts of Edinburgh had lights on both sides, other large swathes were a long way away from any light at all. And this, I think, and the previous map show there are a few things as good as maps for highlighting inequalities. We see their changing distribution and uh, theme as we travel through time, but they're always there. My third example um, is a Bartholomew map produced in the same year as the lighting map in 1898. And there's a nice story uh, behind this uh, relating to Andrew Asher, uh, the rich and successful founder of the North British Distillery Company, who a couple of years earlier had donated £100,000 to fund a hall for concerts, recitals, and other entertainments of a musical nature. One of the only stipulations in his gift was that, his, as he said, it should be begun forthwith in order that he might have the pleasure of seeing it reared in his lifetime. However, he could hardly have expected it would take 14 years just to find somewhere to put it. Unwisely, the town council invited the good citizens of Edinburgh to contribute their ideas. And the kind of dilemmas that were raised 
which were serious, are actually quite familiar to us today. Should good buildings be destroyed? Should green space be encroached upon? Should the hall be sited in the usual concert zone that was then the new town? Or should it try and create a new cultural hub elsewhere? Should it be part of a wider civic improvement scheme? The top site from the last perspective was very much the canal basin of Toll Cross which, it, with its surrounding maze of breweries and slaughterhouses and tenements. But the, the owners, the North British Railway Company, were not keen to part with it. And uh, as one person in the press remarked rather snobbishly, one would scarcely care to plant Versailles in Fountain Bridge. <laughs> Another uh, suggestion was to put the, the Usher Hall in uh, Athol Place between uh, Princess Street and uh, the Haymarket with traffic circling around it like St. Paul's, but that didn't happen either. And so in 1898, the Meadows emerged as a front runner. And the scheme had the great advantage that it didn't require demolition and the council owned it completely. They didn't need to engage in expensive uh, arbitration with another landowner. As the map shows, the hall would only take up three quarters of an acre and leave another 74 acres for recreation and amenity. However, crucially, an act of parliament from 1827 definitively barred permanent construction on the meadows. And although some people in the council thought they could perhaps get the legislation repealed, others were doubtful and they knew it would be a tough battle. Cutting a long story short and a lot of feuding, the vote in the end decided against uh, the meadow site. And so somewhere else had to be found. And it was in fact not until 1910 following a series of acquisitions off the Lothian Road that they settled on the eventual site and construction began uh, in 1911. And I like this map too, because to me often buildings of a century ago seem to have a permanence, some kind of inevitability to them. But this map shows also how different things could have been. My final uh, example is a powerful example of cartographic propaganda, as well as illustrating the importance of the temperance movement at the height of its influence. At one level, we all want to trust the map. We all want to believe elements of it are true. But maps, of course, are one of the most dishonest forms of communication. All maps lie in the sense that they select and distort the reality of the world. But some do this, I think, far better than others. And Bartholomew's clever selection of this particular part of Edinburgh and the stark red symbolization, the size and color of the dots, uh, create really quite a, a striking graphic with a clear message. Following the Temperance Act of 1913, voters in local wards were, were asked whether their area should remain wet or, or go dry. And if more than 10% supported going dry, there was then a formal poll. And that had three options, either no change, a 25% limitation on licenses, or no license at all, a complete abolition of alcohol. And the Edinburgh Citizens No License Council ordered 500 copies of this poster. Uh, this is the the way the poster appeared, and it's a really impressive thing, about 30 inches wide, 40 inches high, that was displayed across polling stations uh, in Edinburgh in December 1923. A map of the whole of Edinburgh showing the distribution of pubs and grocers would have been revealing, but it would have diluted the message quite considerably. And uh, so this neatly delivered a much more striking message with a focus on the Old Town and South Side. In the event, however, the support for no change uh, grew slightly. Only 29% were in favor of no license and for, for, pro sorry, excuse me, for prohibition to be implemented. The no license option required a 55% majority. So in the end, Edinburgh uh, voted to stay wet by a narrow margin. But this map's a very nice uh, indication of that particular moment in, uh, 
in our, in our history. And a final thing I, I would just say too is that posters are often quite ephemeral publications. Uh, they often don't survive in libraries and archives. And this one only survives because Bartholomew kept a proof copy of everything they printed. Everything they printed got bound up in a ledger, a series of ledgers that survive right through to the present day in the Bartholomew archive. And so this forms a nice uh, link with uh, Anna, who spent much time uh, over the last couple of years researching this in the Bartholomew archive and other archives as well. And so this is a good junction for me to, to uh, hand over to her, which also involves a microphone change. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming to listen to us. Um, and thanks to Chris for such an interesting start to the talk. And also to John for inviting me to speak here, but also for listening um, so patiently and enthusiastically to all of the map facts that I come out with on a daily basis. But more than that, really, for giving me um, a creative outlet for some of my PhD research, which has just been so wonderful and such a nice experience. So thank you. So now that you've seen some Bartholomew maps, which I think are some of the most fascinating maps of Edinburgh, I want to talk to you about how they were made and the significance of some of the processes behind map making itself. So this is less about the finished product of the maps than how we get to that point and why it matters. So to set the scene, one of the things that I find most interesting about map making and printing more widely is something that Chris already hinted at, which is how it blurs the line between industrial and intellectual pursuits. So if we return to John George Bartholomew um, for a moment here, who ran the firm from 1888 to 1920. Um, this painting of him, which is in the National Portrait Gallery, was produced to commemorate him getting an honorary degree from the University of Edinburgh in 1908. And as Chris said, John George had wide range of professional associations and honours relating to geography and cartography. And this is where I have to take a really deep breath. So as well as the honorary degree, he was, as mentioned, a founding member of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, and he remained its honorary secretary for his whole life. Um, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 1887, of the Royal Geographical Society in 1888, and he was geographer and cartographer to King George V. He also campaigned throughout his lifetime for a chair of geography to be established at Edinburgh University. And although he did see the appointment of the first lecturer in geography in 1908, it was his son, John Ian, who you've already met, who lived to see the professor appointed in 1931. Now, clearly, John George is a man very much committed to the intellectual side of his work and to the development of geography as an academic discipline, as well as this kind of public resource of sorts. But as well as this, John George ran a firm that employed at its highest point during his leadership over 140 workers in the custom-built premises at Duncan Street that you've seen. So map making and printing are definitely industrial. They've got machines that can take your fingers off, which I'll show you some pictures of in a minute. They've got multiple stages of production and so on. So as with any industrial pursuit, there's a real need, a practical business need, I suppose, to make a profit, to keep the business going. But I think what's really interesting here is that there's more going on than profit making. So you've seen John George has an intellectual commitment to geography and to cartography. And what I always come back to is this quotation from a book historian, J.A. Sutherland, who says, publishers mingled high-mindedness and hard-headedness and that they saw no contradiction in their service to God. And that actually in itself is really interesting because the service to God relates to producing knowledge. So I think there's something there saying that knowledge and moral development go hand in hand. Um, but anyway, they saw no contradiction in their service to God and commerce. So we've got this crossover between industry and intellect. And I think this is especially noticeable in the case of map making or book production because there's a need to produce something tangible some kind of printed knowledge to fulfill the intellectual side of things but this in itself requires industry and so it has to be financially viable now i think this is especially important in the case of edinburgh 
because we have this tendency to think of it as a city of culture and of intellectual pursuits. And, you know, it's a city of enlightenment and of festival shows. But this has been the case for a really long time, since way before the fringe began. Richard Roger, who's my PhD supervisor, wrote an article with Rebecca Madgin about this. And they describe how when foreign dignitaries visited the city, they'd be taken on tours of the most important sites. And this would usually include, as they put it, Castle and Kirk and pomp and circumstance. And it didn't take in any of the city's major factories or breweries um, or hubs of small-scale creative manufacture, all of which were really important features of the Edinburgh economy. And then in a separate piece of research, I looked at the freedom of the city ceremonies in Edinburgh, which were a way of the city honouring and celebrating individuals that it deemed to be important. And I was really interesting to note that amongst all of these politicians, all of the writers, the dignitaries, the comedians, the philanthropists, there were pretty much no industrialists honoured. And on the rare occasion that they were, even then, it wasn't to do with industry. So in the case of the steel baron, Andrew Carnegie, for example, the freedom was a thank you for the money to build the central library on George IV Bridge, which you can see here on the left. There. Is that your, that's your left. Yeah. <laughs> um, and likewise, the city's own industrialist, the brewer, William McEwen, his great big hall is on the right there, that was given as a thank you for providing the money to build it. And this kind of coyness about industrially produced wealth wasn't really replicated in other cities across the UK. So Manchester, for example, would frequently celebrate industry perfectly explicitly. And then, so for a long time, I think it's clear that Edinburgh's had this desire to present itself as a particularly intellectual city. And in many respects it was, and it is, but that's not the whole story and that's what I want to make clear. So one thing we should take away from all this is that 19th century Edinburgh was quite distinctive. It had a really diverse range of industries, many of them quite small or medium scale. And alongside this, historically, it's had a high concentration of very learned professionals. And I think that helps to make it a focal point for an intellectual, associational culture that's driven in quite large part by really active networks and collaborations, which is of course, something that we're still focused on here at Gayfield today. So, with collaboration in mind, go back to the maps. Maps were made through highly collaborative processes in physical ways, which I'll talk about, but also in intellectual ways. And the intellectual side of this relates to the networks of different people who had an influence on the process, which I'll also return to. And then the physical side of it, I mean, the way maps were actually made which is what I'm going to talk about now. So by the time a Bartholomew map looked like this, which is the kind of map that you would have um, in your rucksack or in your car or in your house to keep as just a lovely thing, um, many, many different pairs of hands would have been involved in making it. And in that respect, we might question, and people have done, whether we can even speak about a map maker as such, because who would that be? There's been lots of people involved in it. And so now I just want to show you a few of the different stages of production, really, in making a map. So the process of doing it begins with surveying. And when we think about map making, there's often this kind of image in our head of surveyors out and about with these very mathematical instruments, um, you know, exploring the land and triangulating. And obviously this was really important to very early scientific cartography. But in reality, by the late 19th century, map makers such as Bartholomew were basing their maps on a very different kind of surveying, what you can see on the right. They weren't out in the field. They were using ordnance survey maps to make their own. So they would also speak to members of the public, work with organisations like the Cyclist Touring Club, who I'll come back to, keep newspaper clippings about changes to roads, buildings, bridges, and so on, and generally undertake a really vast range of surveying activities, none of which involve this kind of behaviour. So right from the beginning, I think we really need to think of map making as this highly collaborative process. So once they had this information, the draftsmen would draw the base maps, 
And you can see them here at work in 1895 at Bartholomew's premises at Park Road, now known as that, in Edinburgh, which Bartholomew rented from the printers and publishers Thomas Nelson and Son. This room, as you can maybe tell from the photo, was one of the lightest and airiest in the building. And I think that reflects the importance of the draftsman's work because all the processes that follow are based on their drawings, which were very, very precise. And correspondingly, as you've heard, it was a really highly respected role and apprentices were trained for about seven years. Now, these are some of the tools that they would have used. It's fairly common for apprentices to make some of their own equipment. So in the line drawing tools, which are these ones here, you can see they're often repurposed pen handles or knitting needles, the wooden handles that you can see there. But tools like the spacing divider are precision instruments and they were made in Switzerland and they'd be bought by the apprentices at great expense, um, but they would be expected to last a lifetime, hopefully. So with the base map drawn, you can move on to the printing of maps. So as Chris said, traditionally, a map would be engraved onto a copper plate. And those are some of the tools that an engraver would have used. And then in the 19th century, um, map makers began to print using lithography. And what this means is that instead of printing directly from the copper plate, which would wear the plates down really quickly, the image was transferred from copper plate to paper and from there onto a lithographic stone. And this one shows one of a map of Illinois, and it's one of very few surviving Bartholomew lithography stones, although there are rumours, I don't know if they're true or not, that a rock garden exists somewhere in Edinburgh made from fragments of Bartholomew stones. And if that's true, I would really like to see it, so please keep your eyes and ears open. But um, anyway, these stones are really porous. So you can apply ink where you want it, and a kind of waxy resin where you don't, and then print from them by wetting them and applying paper or cloth. And they can just be polished to remove the image, and that means that they can be reused. And this only takes about a millimetre off the stone, so they last for a lot longer than copper plates would. So using lithography meant new techniques like contour layer colouring, which Chris mentioned, and which you can see here, could be used. And that's because with the stones, you could build up layers of colour. So here, a graduated colour palette is used to represent height above land, as in this map of the Fort William district in Scotland, or even depth of water, which is in this really lovely bathymetric map on the right, um, which shows Loch Mora. And this type of colouring is probably pretty standard to most of you now, but it was really innovative when it was first introduced, and it received a very mixed reaction when Bartholomew first exhibited it um, in 1878 at the Paris Exhibition. So applying colour to the stones was a really difficult process. It was affected by temperature and light. Again, highly, highly skilled. And it was carried out, interestingly, by an all-female department of colourists. And these women trained for five years and they would only begin to work on actual jobs after around three years of practice. So eventually, after all these processes, and there are still more to come, the maps were printed. So... And I just love these images. Here on the left, you can see Robert Trotter. He's transferring a sheet of proof maps to a lithographic stone, which they'll then be printed from. And the actual act of printing is shown on the right, where John Shields and Peggy Lowe, um, all of these, I should say, as well, are Bartholomew employees. So John and Peggy are working together here to use a flatbed printing machine. And it was normal for printers to work in pairs like this. So Peggy's feeding paper into the machine, and John would have applied gum and resin to the lithographic stone um, to ensure that the colours transfer appropriately to the paper, and he would then pull it backwards and forwards through the machine. So the final step was to mount and varnish and fold the maps. Now, different types of maps would go through different finishing processes, so some would be mounted on cloth, some would be varnished and put on rollers for use in school classrooms, which you've probably seen those beautiful great big maps. Um, and that's what's going on here on the right. And some would be simply folded. And actually, I say simply folded, but map making, map folding, sorry, is a complete art in its own right. And until the 1950s, all Bartholomew maps were folded by hand, which is a huge undertaking. 
So that's how a map's made. And although Bartholomew, sorry, I'll go back, but although Bartholomew produced lots of their own maps and atlases, what I want to talk about now is how there's more to getting a map from idea to reader than just physically making it on site. So in Edinburgh, production and collaboration also took place on a city-wide scale. So Bartholomew, for example, would frequently produce maps for Edinburgh's many printing and publishing firms. <laughs> These firms often had fairly close relations. And that's shown in a letter that I'm about to show you that I actually just showed you an accidental preview of from John George Bartholomew, who you know, to Sir John Clark of the legal booksellers and publishers T&T Clark, who were based on George Street. And I think this encapsulates the balance of personal and business interactions really well. So he writes, I cannot say how much I feel with you in the loss of your father. His kindly and familiar figure will be much missed in Edinburgh. At the time of his death, I was laid up with another bout of influenza and regretted being unable to attend the funeral. Not wishing to trouble you with a call at the present time, I enclose what may form a small perspective for the map of Palestine. And he goes on to elaborate. I still think it would be well to put it in a case with your Bible dictionary. And while adhering to one price already quoted, we do not object to you increasing the publishing price to 10 and 6 if you think it will not interfere with the sale. Of course, the addition of the index will add to your cost. The index was a pretty heavy piece of work, and I find that in addition to my time on it, its complication has actually cost us £15 in wages alone. However, we should be glad to simply uphold this expenditure. So this sort of gentlemanly, very kind sentiment that then goes straight into purposeful business dealings is an important mix, I think. And it's very significant here that these firms are in the same city, so they know each other. And I think this leads to collaboration on a more meaningful level. So on the scale that Bartholomew are working at, they also worked with firms elsewhere, of course, elsewhere in the UK. Um, but the fact that Edinburgh firms were so frequently using each other's services says something very interesting about locality and loyalty. Now, making connections is a complex process, as I'm sure we can all appreciate. Um, so later on, in the early 20th century, Bartholomew sent one of their company directors to London every few months specifically for the purpose of making connections and meeting interesting people. And that was a very expensive and time-consuming process in itself. And so building on personal connections that already exist within the city, school, maybe family, church, and so on, to then foster business relations actually makes a lot of sense. And then these connections, by their very nature, would have to be local. So we've thought about how maps are made in a physical way. Um, and there, in terms of some of the intellectual and personal connections that also play a role in shaping them. And then I want to pick up on some of Chris's themes and think about maps as a way of understanding space. So when our surveyors and our draftsmen and our colourists and our engravers and our printers and our mounters make a map, what they're doing, in some ways, is translating. So they're translating space into a different form. This is where I work, in the history school at the university. And then, of course, it was still the medical school. So how does this physical environment, the buildings, streets, paths, trees, and lampposts, actually get onto a map? And in fact, we might even say, if we were being really pedantic, this is just a photo. This is only a representation, too. The real physical environment, the real thing that's being translated isn't this, it's what's out there. But how does it become this? So I mentioned earlier that Bartholomew often worked with the Cyclists Touring Club when they were in the process of compiling a map, one of the first stages of production. And this is kind of like an early form of crowdsourcing. So the cyclists would write to them and correct any existing maps and I'm sure that if any of you are cyclists, you can imagine the kind of things that they would notice, bends in the road in the wrong place and potholes and road quality and that kind of thing. And that, to me, says something really interesting about conceptions of space. And the fact that Bartholomew actually really valued that specific type of knowledge is very important. 
So when you ride a bike, you connect with the land in a different way to if you walk it or drive it. Or maybe if you skip along it, like these girls in the Dean village here. And that knowledge feeds directly into the eventual maps that we're seeing, which I think, if you think about it, is really quite extraordinary. People's personal experiences go into a map. And then, likewise, John Bartholomew Jr., who managed the firm in the mid-19th century, before John George, was a really keen supporter of the Scottish Rights of Way Society. And walkers and fell runners connect with the land in a different way again. And actually, this doesn't have to involve getting out of the city, although, of course, the Scottish Rights of Way Society's dealings here do largely relate to the countryside. But I know from my own experience that although I've always known that in the way that you do that Edinburgh is a hilly city, I've never really felt that until I started cycling and running. And to return to rights of way, walkers wrote letters to the Scotsman, for example, complaining that a route in the Pentlands that was marked as public access on a Bartholomew map was actually closed off. So they'd gone to walk it, found it was a private path. And John Bartholomew responded directly in the newspaper. He wrote back to the Scotsman and he said when he walked that route, it was open and accessible. And so the map was correct to the best of his knowledge. And it transpired that it had been closed off despite being a public right of way. And then it was subsequently reopened. And I think it's really, really interesting here that he'd walked it himself, or at least he claimed to, and I don't think we've got any reason to disbelieve him about that, as a way of legitimising what he put on the map. So personal experience of land is still so, so important, even though maps are generally becoming more rationalised and more scientific in this period. So in terms of the translation that I mentioned earlier, you can see space physical space and map making is linked so fundamentally. And I think what I love about this is that in a large part, what links them is our own experience. And it's about making our experience of space make sense on paper. And some maps do this better than others. So to finish, we can read a map because we accept it as a set of marks or signifiers that represent space. So in a way, they're a kind of code, albeit a fairly literal one on the surface. But as Chris showed you, maps can be much more than a simple wayfinding device. They can tell us about social inequalities or plans for a city that never were, a kind of alternative history, if you like. So yes, they stop us from getting lost and they let us know where we are but that's in quite a deep and meaningful way, as well as, do I turn left or right here? And they're one of the most interesting ways of exploring the past, and I think that's true in terms of how they were made, as well as what they show once they were made. And I hope you agree. But that's where I'll leave it. But I know that Chris and I are very happy to take further questions or discuss anything that you're interested in further. So thank you. Surface it, you know, with the later on. We've got always the benefit of looking back and kind of 
you know, looking at something intended for another purpose and seeing, if you like, kind of creating something out of it with our present day concerns and interests. And I think, you know, everyone can read them up in their own way. That's always the nice thing about them. There's never really a final answer. Everyone can say, well, I got out of the map of this, you know, they can get that out of the map. But uh, I think there's some quite interesting possibilities with digital technologies of examining things like inequality dynamically and uh, quite a lot of work going on that allow people to say interrogate a census from say you know 2011 and overlay it in quite striking colours and actually create their own map there's sort of more possibilities these days to interrogate and produce maps of inequality than there would have been a century ago when the, the, the data would have been much harder to manipulate and kind of do something with now. I have a medical background and uh, some very interesting uh, pioneering workers um, to your heart and wheels and says and Helen, a great social um, medical uh, uh, worker. You use maps very specifically in that thing. And in Scotland, we have the Carstairs Index, which is a postcode based modes of uh, and locality based mode. Quite blunt as a tool, and there are very interesting uh, new ways of funding areas of particular deprivation, and they often use. Basis on, on which money goes to places that need it. Yeah, very interesting. Following on from that, and you mentioned that I think it was a John George that said that the dual responsibilities of God and commerce, uh, which informed his map making. Mm. I wonder how much of a moral responsibility and social reform aspect there was with with the Bartholomews. Was that something that informed these kind of? Um, maps mapping out tuberculosis and things like that as well. Were they, were they philanthropists or were they you know, interested in the, in the poverty and highlighting it? They certainly had um, interest in kind of urban sociology, I would say. I mean, John George was very keen to work with Patrick Geddes, who set up um, what's now Camera Obscura, the observatory in Edinburgh, which um, it was a kind of social observation project. And I think they never actually collaborated as directly as he would have liked, is that right? But um, they certainly exchanged lots of correspondence on that. I'm not sure whether you have any more ideas. I think John George always had aspirations to kind of do non-commercial cartography, and that often involved many things that were not profitable and engaging with causes that weren't usually very lucrative ones. And I think that it's difficult to say, to my mind, that he especially identified with any particular moral crusade. The diversity of Bartholomew's output is, is so broad, and uh, there's so many things that, that they were mapping, that it's difficult to kind of, yeah, that they were really concerned about this. And even in connections with the temperance movement, it wasn't really as if they were trying to push that. It was that the temperance movement when I was striking that, and Bartholomew were the leading map makers who could make it. Uh, but they could equally well have produced maps for other aims. I think John George was very interested in pushing the boundaries of thematic mapping, which is very kind of taken for granted now. But in the later 19th century, we're still relatively new and trying to show something that wasn't just topography of like, you know, the life of the land out there, but trying to show something that's deliberately another type of subject. And so that often allowed them to do maps that were quite specific niche subjects for medical journals or for the town council or for you know things that were for improvement purposes. So yeah, I think you'll find in Bartholomew maps that were clearly kind of towards that end. But I find it difficult to sort of highlight them and say, yeah, that, that was a kind of defining um, ingredient. What movements or um, possibilities now to access old maps? Is there any websites or development making all the So similar to there is a stage. I don't know whether I can go onto the web now. <laughs> Goodness, someone asked me that. Well, actually, yeah, I've heard it say at the beginning, but most of my day job for the last 20 years has been putting maps online, so I never <laughs> tire of an opportunity to try and show at least our website, although it would be quite a nice opportunity to show the Gayfield site as well. This viewer, which is on the Gayfield website, allows you to explore a sequence of historic maps of Gayfield 
environs from 1804 coming through to the present day. So you can just click on uh, this side, slightly tricky with a, uh, a laptop, and it'll jump to the particular map maker and the date and allow you to kind of step your way uh, so through time. This is the garden outside, and we are retracing this map with our Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays lunchtime walk. This is a healthy lunchtime walk. The research suggests if you walk 30 minutes a day, you get some health benefit. So we've devised a retracing and remaking of the 1876 Ordnance Survey map. Uh, garden path. And lovely if you can join us, and it's uh, we've got some festival performers and some interesting walkers joining us too. And what's interesting too is we go forward in time, we lose the concentric circle. So I think by the 1890s town plan, it's uh, a sequence of small rectangles. Can I jump in here? Yeah, okay. We're also doing some research on the Gayfield locality over the next year. I have a very close friend who's a great football person. He's a uh, an Italian fanatical footballer. And uh, his, if we could click back to that last one, Chris. The 1890s one? Yes. Yeah. These squares existed quite a bit longer than this map. And Gennaro tells the story of when he was uh, a boy uh, playing football in the square and having to play football at the far end near the side gate. So if the party came, they could all rush out. So we're looking for some uh, from stories from locals who know the area, work, play, or uh, recreation uh, in the area. Great. So that's um, the historic map viewer, and also on the Gayfield uh, site, under Walks by Design, John was very charitable in saying, I've been involved in these, but actually, John is the central person who's put the roots and the, the information uh, together and so we've got a, a kind of black and white uh, map backdrop, uh, a green route and then each of these locations there are the key things to look out for and also the places to get a cup of coffee or other refreshing on route. Yeah. <laughs> so what we've done is work, this is, a, this is the design of collaboration and I'll be working with uh, Parks Department and with these wonderful creative initiatives around Edinburgh. Uh, there are six in each group, and we just give uh, we've embedded a little piece in this one um, on each of them. There is an association with a series of cafe. We're, we're celebrating cafe culture in some regards, and they're holding what we're calling the pace post box in each cafe. If you're in it, or you're going walks, or you'd like to tell anyone about the walks, you can go to the local cafe and you can jot down. We're looking for prose poems, pictures, sketches, anything physical you want to put in the box, well, if you <laughs> rephrase that a bit, or just something about the walk or a reflection. And of course, we, uh, we want to encourage the online dynamic there as well. So we've got our hashtag, walks by design, hashtag walks by design. Uh, and we'll use that for Twitter and for Instagram. And you can email us as well. So email is the old fashioned way. So there you go. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. well, Right. Do you want to say any more about Gayfield? Uh, Gayfield no. uh, projects? I think um, they're the main maps, but it's a work in progress, and who knows, there could be another map as well at some point. At some point. Um, if anyone is interested, I'll just grab your attention for a moment longer to say that the, uh, the NLS Maps website um, can be found at uh, maps.nls.uk, and we have uh, at the moment, 120,000 maps of Scotland, England, Wales, and beyond, and including now about 600 detailed maps of Edinburgh. You can search in all sorts of ways, and I won't, I can give talks for an hour and a half about our websites. <laughs> uh, just to show you, you can dive on into town plans, for example, uh, and uh, the maps of Edinburgh, and then you get a chronology of uh, the, the maps over time, and as you scroll down into the 19th century, you've got uh, uh, quite a number of the uh, Bartholomew maps, including the one that Anna showed uh, images of, the famous 1891 map, that's also uh, with a very nice uh, reproduction next door. And for any of these maps, you can, uh, you can click on the image, hopefully with rather more finesse than I'm demonstrating uh, here, with a laptop, but then zoom on 
in and out. And as you zoom on in on the images, they should refresh really quickly and allow you to move and uh, uh, pan around. And we also have a set of georeferenced maps, which are like the historic map viewer that uh, we, we uh, showed for Gayfield. And georeferencing allows the maps to be positioned um, in their real world location so they can be displayed on top of uh, modern satellites or, or map view. So here I'm uh, displaying the Bartholomew map. You can zoom on in um, on your area uh, of interest and then fade the transparency over on, on this side as you drag the blue blob over to the left hand side. It allows you to compare it to modern day satellite imagery <laughs> and uh, you can also display the historic map side by side so have an historic map on the left and a modern map on the right and zoom and pan around it's a great way this of wasting hours fantastic <laughs> 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 okay. oh, I mean I just I mean I'm sure everyone can see uh, can I please ask everyone to find you and I find you um, Chris Hitt. chat amongst yourselves and with, with ourselves up here and have a look around the exhibition as well and thank you very much for coming. Cheers.